So in your response, you, you talked about financial risks that you knew you would encounter if you left uh, a, another position you had to go into theater. So just building off of that, I am really fascinated to know <coughs> what other risks you, you feel you had to not just face, but overcome. Being away from family. And being more lonely in a hearing environment. Ah, uh, okay. It's what we call mainstream, the mainstream theater. I'm the only deaf actor in a hearing company, and the hearing company doesn't sign. And I have to have an interpreter with me. Um, and you know, but there's also show, social time, going to the bar after a show, rehearsals, and the interpreter's gone home. Uh, you know, and I'm stuck, and I mean, so I'm stuck alone, and I can't lip read a hundred percent. So I sacrifice a lot on a social level. Being away from home and family, my two boys, my wife. But it's easier now than it was in the past. Like in Ajax, when we traveled to Europe, or just any time when I was away from home, I think I, I was in Washington, D.C. for three months, and we would write letters back and forth. That was in 1987, so we had to do letters. And now we have this high technology. technology. We have video phones, email, texting. So... So I'm able to maintain contact with my wife on a daily basis, and that really helps. So, yeah, time has changed so much. When I was in Europe, I would write a letter, and it would take two weeks for the letter to get there, and then I'd get a response. You know, I would write letters every day, and then, you know, I would answer a question, but they wouldn't get the answer for two or, week, two or three weeks after that. So, anyway. In your mind, what were, were there specific obstacles that you felt might exist to integrating you into the company as, as a, a deaf actor? Yeah, like I said before, the social part. Okay. I'm left out of the group conversations, like in the green room, in between scenes, um, before the show, after the show. You know, I'm not able to participate in shop talk. You know, I can't hear all of the war stories from the older actors, the veterans, you know, I miss out on hearing their stories, and I don't have the opportunity to benefit from their experiences, how they handle different situations or tips, you know, on job opportunities. That's the main thing. That's the main obstacle for me. There might be some restrictions on the kind of roles that I can play. You know, it has to make sense for it to work. You know, an example of this is if I play a king. You know, I can imagine playing a role as a king because, you know, you know, I can imagine playing the king role, you know, and having a, like an assistant interpret for me, you know, follow me around, a servant, you know, maybe being the interpreter. I can imagine that. So we're experimenting with different ways of how to provide voiceovers for my characters. And sometimes I do speak for myself on stage. I don't imagine that I'd be able to speak a role for more than a few minutes, you know, a few minutes at a time. I couldn't go on for an hour. Um, the audience would become very tired of hearing my deaf voice. They wouldn't understand everything that I said. So, so that's one limitation. I would not be able to speak vocally for my character for an extended amount of time. But for, like, Hamlet, when I say, oh, horrible. Horrible. Oh, horrible, most horrible. You know, I could do that for impact, a really short, a short blurb. And then in To Kill a Mockingbird next year, 
we're debating what kind of character I am. Am I totally deaf? Um, am I illiterate? If I'm illiterate, then I wouldn't be able to speak because he doesn't have language skills to lip read and it would be totally dependent on um, my daughter. So we're debating that, but there's a lot of value in me speaking for myself if I want to have an emotional outburst, you know, during the trial, or maybe my daughter refuses to interpret what I say. So I blow up, and maybe at that moment I would speak for myself. So it's all in discussion right now. Um, we had a really wonderful, stimulating meeting yesterday for Mockingbird, and wow, it's really mind-blowing, and I'm really excited about that play to be a deaf character that's normally played by a hearing actor. So I'm so grateful to Bill Rausch and OSF, the company, the administrative staff. They've been totally accommodating of my needs, my deafness. And the actors have been learning to sign themselves you know, for plays and also to communicate with me. It's really amazing how quickly some of the actors have been picking it up. Some of the actors can't pick it up. They don't have the quote unquote hands for it. <laughs> There's good hands and bad hands for signing. 